Hi, my name is Reed Draper. I'm a senior software engineer at Basho. Uh, we're going to be talking about building fault tolerant teams. Uh, the asterisk there, this is an, an unexpected journey, as Garrett would like to say. Uh, actually, the unexpected journey was going and having too many beers with Steve last night, so. Uh, should have been expected, but I didn't see it coming. Um, Garrett actually helped quite a bit with this talk. He helped with the description. He sent all the speakers these cool graphics about how to set, uh, situate your slides on this nice big projector. So if you don't like the talk, you can go ahead and blame Garrett. Uh, so the premise of this talk is that with Erlang, we're capable of building fault-tolerant applications. But I'm going to claim that just using Erlang is not sufficient. You can't just sit at a computer, choose to write Erlang, and then magically you have this fault-tolerant application. A human still actually has to write the software. An imperfect human, right? So this talk is about the tools that we use at Basho to augment ourselves and augment our teams to make sure that the Erlang code we're writing is actually fault-tolerant software, especially when you have a mission-critical application. So we write a distributed database uh, called React, and our customers demand that React uh, meets the goals. We strive for... Uh, maximum availability, fault tolerance, and so we need to make sure that the software that we're building actually meets these things. So, uh, so these are some of the tools that we use. We're not going to go through all of these. Um, as I said, I work for Basho. We make React, which is a distributed database, and we're aiming for maximum availability. Uh, React is a distributed system. You run it on five or a hundred or a thousand nodes. And the system as a whole needs to continue running even when there are uh, faults in hardware, faults in the software that we've written, faults in third-party software, a disk fills up. The whole system needs to continue running. And we need to make sure that our, uh, our customers actually have the durability that they expect when they're storing data in a database. This is usually one of the most important parts of a customer's application. So, Making sure that it really works is important. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about how we've gotten here. Um, because I do think, for the most part, React does meet these goals. And it's been a tough journey getting there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do to make sure that we don't make some of the same mistakes twice. So uh, whenever we have a bug that's been merged into our develop or master branch or uh, has unfortunately been released to a customer, we like to ask ourselves, how did this bug make it through? What's wrong with our process that allowed this particular type of bug to make it this far and actually be released in the product? And what can we do to improve our process to make sure that bugs of this type don't make it in again? You know, we obviously can't be perfect. We can't eliminate every bug. But we found that there's a huge benefit toward trying to generalize the type of a bug that's found, and looking to see what we can do to prevent bugs of that nature in the future. So we ask ourselves questions like, is it a logic issue? Is this just an off by one error, something that perhaps a test or better code review could have caught? Is it a type mismatch? Uh, maybe we're not using dialyzer as much as, uh, as much as we could here. Is it a performance issue? Do we need to have better testing that's running on every commit to make sure that we're not having uh, performance regressions. Is it a typo? This is a pretty embarrassing issue, but these things do happen. And there are tools like XREF that actually can catch typos. Uh, and I found that to be really useful. So let's go through first the core of how we actually get these tools running on our code. Uh, we use BORS, BuildBot, and then code review to sort of tie these things together. Uh, how many of you are familiar with BuildBot? OK, so BuildBot is a continuous integration framework. Uh, it's written in Python. It's a Jenkins-like thing or a Travis CI, but you run it on your own servers. Uh, and so we have BuildBot running uh, testing uh, with eUnit every commit we make on all of our repositories. And this is an example of what that looks like. So you can see this is testing the React KV, which is a, a sub-application of React. Uh, 
this is the git revision that uh, triggered this build. And we have these steps here. So we're going to update git, we're going to get dependencies, we're going to compile, run tests. Uh, this E unit, as you can see, it runs a bunch of different things. It runs a bunch of quick check, quick check tests as well, which we'll talk about. And it runs xref and dialyzer. And if any of these steps fail, we actually don't allow the developer to merge this code into the branch that they're trying to merge into. So we actually now demand that every revision that uh, developers commit passes dialyzer, which has been a huge improvement for us. Uh, we have all of this set up with our code review process as well. So uh, we use GitHub uh, pull requests to do code review and to uh, signal the intent to merge code in. So here's an example here. This is in React CS. Uh, a developer wants to merge some code in. Uh, someone's going to be assigned to code review it. They look through the diff. They uh, you know, perhaps go back and forth with a developer giving feedback, uh, things that could be improved, maybe finding bugs just by looking at the code. And then once they're satisfied with it, they're going to give a plus one for this. And you see actually that they're giving a plus one on a specific revision. We're not just saying, hey, this whole pull request and whatever the contents of this branch are are okay to be merged, but this specific revision. Because part of what happens when you go through code review is you submit patches uh, that respond to the feedback that you get. So we want to make sure that those patches are actually getting uh, code reviewed as well. Person or is that somebody on the team? That's doing the code review? Uh, no, it, uh, the whole team does code review. Yep, so it's not a dedicated person. Uh, and then you see here, we have this bot that's called Borshop. Uh, this is using a tool called Bors. Uh, this is uh, free software that you can find on GitHub. It's used for uh, Rust, which is a programming language out of Mozilla. Uh, you're obliged to have a, a funny meme as, as, as the photo for the GitHub user. Um, and what Bors does is it actually listens for this code review feedback and triggers builds based on this. And it makes sure that no code ever gets merged that doesn't pass both code review and, uh, and all the tests. So what's going to happen here is once the bot sees that this revision uh, has been code reviewed, it's going to actually kick off a new build in the continuous integration system. But instead of just testing this, re uh, uh, this revision, it's going to actually create a merge commit with the target branch that the developer wants to merge into. Because that could actually not just be a fast forward. That could be a real merge that, uh, that might fail tests. So that's going to create a new revision on a throwaway branch. And then uh, all of the tests via BuildBot are actually going to be run on that merge commit as well. And only if the tests pass on that merge commit can the code be merged in. Uh, Bors, which is this bot, actually does all of the merging. So we can actually make sure, too, that by the time the tests have passed and it goes to merge in, it can check and see if that merge commit it's created is stale or not. So if another pull request had been merged in the, uh, in the meantime, then that merge commit is stale, and we actually have to do the whole process over again. But Bors does that all automatically for you, so it's not something that you as a developer have to think about. But what it means is that our develop or our master branch is always being fast forwarded to a merge commit that's been tested. There's never a case where a commit passes tests and then once it gets merged in, now our main development branch is broken. This has been a huge benefit for us because it means that, uh, you know, aside from uh, flaky tests, our development branch always passes. There's no exception to that. Um, so as I said before, it goes through and it runs all of these steps. And you can actually look at the output of these. There's a link uh, that's pasted to this from GitHub. So it makes it really easy if for some reason, let's say dialyzer fails, a developer can actually just click the link uh, to get to this view and see why dialyzer is failing their code. Uh, so now that we've gone through how uh, the framework that we have uh, let's actually start digging into some of the tools that we have set up with this continuous integration system. Uh, so as you saw before, adding a new tool is really just as simple as adding a new build step there, which makes it really easy if we have a new idea for 
a tool that could be useful for us. We don't have to set up uh, all these mechanics. We just add a new step there, and we're able to pass and fail our builds uh, just by adding a new step. How many of you are familiar with Dialyzer? All right, I like to see that. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Dialyzer is an application that comes with your install of Erlang OTP. And it's a, uh, a static, analysis, static analysis tool. So uh, Erlang is a dynamically typed language. And with Dialyzer, nothing changes about that, right? If you have type errors, your code will continue to compile without any problem. Dialyzer sits off to the side and does static analysis that is similar to what a static type system would do. You're able to, uh, to annotate your code if you want, but Dialyzer will find type errors and present them to you. Uh, and we found this to be a huge benefit, enough that we don't let any code get merged in that doesn't pass Dialyzer. Um, so here's an example here. Uh, does this code have any type uh, mistakes? Right, we have no idea, right? You know, unless you go through and sort of do type checking in your head, I don't know, is, is that the right return value for this? It turns out that this was a real, you know, somewhat embarrassing bug that we had that the result of get my ring is actually okay ring or error in something and not just ring. So this is an example of where we saw a bug and we said, okay, what can we do to try and prevent this whole class of error? This is something that, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room has made a, a mistake like this uh, with Erlang before. Uh, the good news is that, you know, as trivial and embarrassing as this bug is, there are tools that really help you uh, to fix them. Uh, and we found that we make a whole lot less mistakes like this once we have Dialyzer running on all of our commits. Um, because Dialyzer has a built-in language for actually describing these types, it's something that can actually be put in your code as well. So if we look at, uh, again at this function, it's not clear what the types that we're dealing with here. Uh, and I found that types work as really good documentation. So with that language, we can actually have a spec here that says that we're going to take an object in and then we're going to return a list that maps binaries to LFS manifests. LFS manifest is a type that we've created. And if we wanted to, we could go dig into the implementation of that and see what that looks like. Um, in hooking it up with our continuous integration system, we have found uh, a few roadblocks, nothing that we couldn't get past, but I want to share uh, some of these with you in case you find yourself going on a similar journey. This is what continuous integration expects of a build. It either passes or it fails, right? And Dialyzer, if you've ever run it, especially on a code base that you haven't really been staying up to date with Dialyzer, is going to give you a few hundred warnings. But they're warnings, right? Some of the, you know, this is code that has probably been running in production and for the most part works. So are we going to have to go fix every single one of those? So somehow we need to be able to turn this, uh, you know, these hundreds of warnings from Dialyzer into a binary pass fail because at the end of the day, we only want to merge code in that does go green. So we need some way to do that. Uh, and we use a bunch of makefile, sed, grep, uh, magic to do that. So we actually have in our code base a dialyzer ignore file, which is, you know, we've given up trying to fix these uh, specific warnings. Uh, so when we run dialyzer, we actually subtract those known issues from the output. And if any lines make it through that filter, the build fails then. And if you're not careful, that ignore file will just continue to grow and grow. And Dialyzer is not really doing you any good. Um, but if you do have some discipline, what's nice about this is you can actually start using this before you've fixed any Dialyzer errors. And what that means is that you can actually prevent new errors from being introduced. So you can say, OK, we have a bunch of Dialyzer errors here. We're not going to wait until we fix all of them 
before we start using this new thing. But at least we can say, if any new errors are introduced in our application, they're not going to make it through that filter. We, you know, uh, we've ignored everything, but new errors are going to be presented to us. And then if you do have the discipline, hopefully you'll start to have diffs like this, where you remove the warnings from here. And there's no secret here. You really just need to have the discipline to start going and trying and fixing some of the dialyzer warnings that you have. Um, you will find some really fun bugs this way. Uh, it's a lot of work, but I highly recommend this exercise. Uh, this exercise. It's been a huge benefit to us. Um, and sometimes you just have to ignore a whole file and, and sort of give up. In this case, this is uh, generated code that we just could not figure out why Dialyzer was having a problem with it. So sometimes you do have to sort of just uh, throw your hands up. Uh, Here's a tweet from my coworker Chris Micklejohn, uh, sort of expressing his uh, his pride with this process. And then, after all this work, uh, my coworker Sean found that uh, we had 31 commits that mentioned Dialyzer in React 2. This is just ones that actually mention it. I'm sure there are a bunch of fixes where people didn't mention it, um, but we found a lot of really fun bugs this way. Next, we're going to talk about React Test, which is a, uh, an integration system that we've written. It's, uh, it's open source Apache 2 license. Uh, for the most part, it's pretty React specific, but it certainly could be used to test other distributed systems. Uh, and what React Test allows us to do is stand up whole clusters. So we could actually stand up a five node cluster here and a five node cluster there and actually uh, turn on replication between them, and run tests without the test having to worry about the details uh, of standing up this cluster. Um, and since this is actually standing up a real cluster, uh, we can do interesting things like test network partitions and stuff. Uh, so this is a simple test here that is testing some command line things, uh, but you can also write some much more complicated tests. This one uh, has quite a bit of scrolling that you can't even see here, which is uh, testing for Byzantine faults in React Ensemble, which is uh, the foundation of our new strong consistency, which is in uh, React 2.0. Uh, we also use EDOC, and we had a really similar experience to this uh, that we had with Dialyzer. We found that if you're actually not creating uh, your edocs. Turns out if you just run edoc on an existing code base, edoc is going to fail because you're going to have all sorts of really fun syntax errors like uh, backtick and then backtick instead of backtick and apostrophe. Uh, but we found that this has been uh, really nice for us. So one of the things that we're moving toward doing is actually creating uh, the edoc and uploading it to S3 on every commit. So when you're doing code review, there's going to be a link to S3 where you can click and uh, view the edoc that's generated for exactly that commit and sort of make sure that the developer uh, is adding new documentation and stuff. All of these functionality are shared between our different repositories. So we've created a common make file that we use that's called tools.mk. Uh, uh, tools it's also open source available here. Uh, these are the different uh, targets it provides. And this is pretty general, so this, uh, this is something that uh, might be worth looking at. How many of you have ever heard of Quick Check before? All right. So I guess, it, I guess that Quick Check's not so much of a secret weapon considering how many hands just went up. Um, but at least. Uh, maybe two years ago, it felt like a secret weapon. Uh, so we use uh, the Cuvic version of Erlang Quick Check, which is a proprietary one, although there is a free version of it called Quick Check Mini that you can download from this site. Uh, there's also some open source alternatives. Trick and Proper are uh, two popular ones in Erlang. So for those of you who don't know, uh, a quick explanation of what Quick Check is is an implementation of what's called property-based testing. And instead of enumerating examples uh, like you would in traditional unit tests, you actually 
declare an entire property about your code, and then Quick Check is able to randomly generate input and try and prove or disprove that property for you. Uh, so an example here is if we were testing the reverse function. A trivial property that we might come up about the reverse function is that the reverse of the reverse is equal to whatever the input is, right? Uh, we could also say that reverse should preserve the length, or the first element should now be the last element. And instead of having to enumerate all these cases, we can just say, hey, quick check, uh, come up with 10,000 random lists and test that this property is actually true. This is a really simple case, but we've used quick check to test software that would otherwise be really, really, really difficult to do traditional unit or integration testing because the state space is so big. So imagine testing something like Bitcask or LevelDB, which are two of our backends for React, which actually store data on disk. Um, part of their functionality is basically just a durable hash map, right? So what we can do is since we have a known working implementation of an associative data structure in Erlang, we can actually use that as our model to compare with Bitcask or LevelDB. And we can say, for any sequence of git, put, and uh, random delete operations, the result of doing that with Bitcask or LevelDB, which have to worry about merging files on disk, they have to worry uh, potentially about storing data in, uh, in order, but we can still compare that with this implementation that we already have uh, for free. And we've found, as you might imagine, a bunch of really fun bugs doing this. Uh, so this is a bug that my coworker Scott Fritchie found in Bitcask. Um, and these are the kind of things that you just don't find these bugs with traditional unit testing. The, uh, the counter examples that Quick Check comes up with are things like open Bitcask, open Bitcask, close, write this uh, special value that you look at the binary and you're like, huh, that's a funky binary, and then close it. And for some reason, that causes a bug. It's not the kind of thing that you're ever going to come up with that unit test yourself. And if you do, there's a thousand more that you aren't actually coming up with. Um, there's a great talk by John Hughes at uh, Closure West from this year. Uh, come grab me after if you don't have time to write this down. But it's uh, a talk on YouTube that I highly recommend watching. Another example that we found using uh, quick check to find bugs is a race condition uh, that Andrew Thompson found in Poolboy. How many of you are familiar with Poolboy? So Poolboy is a uh, process or resource pooling library. There's a blog post about testing it here, but this is a nice quote uh, from Andrew that I'd like to share. Uh, so he had found Poolboy and wrote a bunch of tests for it. And he's thinking, now, Poolboy had 85% test coverage when I started quick checking it. And I felt pretty happy with its, with its solidity. So I didn't expect to find many bugs, if any. I was very wrong. I think we found something like seven really, really interesting concurrency issues with Poolboy here that none of the unit tests had found. And as he was fixing uh, the bugs, none of the unit tests showed anything. They just continued to pass. Uh, so if you haven't taken a look at Quick Check yet, it's something that I would highly recommend. Uh, anyway, I think that's it for me. But I'm happy to answer any questions or come find me after, and uh, I'll be happy to answer anything. Thank you. I saw you mentioned using eUnit. Like, how do you deal with issues when eUnit swallow all your sections and you just can't find what exactly is failing? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question, please? So, um, you were mentioned when you were mentioning tools that you use at Bashio, you mm -hmm. mentioned eUnit. How do you deal with cases when eUnit swallow all the exceptions and you just can't find, like, you get stuck at what exactly um, is wrong? Like, in between. Writing, you're trying to TD what you, whatever you're doing, and then you write a test, and even it just swallows all the exceptions. Okay. So the question is, uh, the question, if I understand it, is when you're writing a test with eUnit and 
the code under test throws some exception and eUnit just swallows the exception, uh, what do you do? Um, to be honest, that's, that's not a situation that I've uh, found myself in before. Uh, but come find me afterward and I can take a look uh, you know, and see if there's uh, some magic there. Joe? Yeah, a comment, I mean, about unit testing. In my, in my strange loop lecture, I just pointed out that six 32-bit variables have in C have got more possible states than the number of atoms on the planet. So it doesn't really surprise me that, that uh, writing half a dozen tests isn't much good. You know, you need this property-based testing. Yeah. That's, that's state-of-the-art. I like that explanation. I mean, that is state-of-the-art. Anybody who's not using property-based testing is not using state-of-the-art. Yeah. I noticed you uh, mentioned EUNIT, but you, know, uh, you didn't mention cover test. I was wondering if you've used cover test or not. I have not used cover test. Um, no. It's pretty handy. You might want to look at it. It comes right <laughs> along with so. Basically, gives you kind of a mini uh, hammer type test for it where you can put in multiple scenarios as opposed to just a single one. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, in front here. Uh, any advice or good articles for. Uh, Techniques for getting good at property-based testing? Yeah, that's a good. So the question is, uh, are there any articles, books, uh, or advice for getting better at property-based testing? Uh, to be honest, I think this is actually kind of a weak point with property-based testing right now. There's not a lot of freely available uh, material for it. There is a book about ScalaCheck, which I've not read yet, but I've heard really good things about. Um, and my understanding is that a pretty good portion of that book is not Scala specific. Uh, so even if you kind of only half read Scala or something, I think uh, that might be worth looking at. Um, other than that, you know, there's a bunch of random blog posts and stuff that you can find online. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, there's no uh, massively online, you know, class about it or anything like that, or a general book about thinking in the mindset, because I think uh, that's sort of the difficult part about property-based testing is that it takes a really different mindset. Joe. And another comment, I mean, property-based testing is what you do after you've done. Once you've got 100% coverage, once you have observed zero, pro zero errors in your program, that's when you start property-based testing. And don't expect to find, a, if you're going to use cutting-edge technology, don't expect to find tutorials that tell you it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole point about it. <laughs> I mean, if you can read about it on the net, everybody else is using it. You have no commercial advantage. Yeah, which I guess is why it you know, still sort of feels like a secret weapon, despite the fact that you know, half this room has already played with it, which is a good thing, I think. But, all right, I think we'll probably have time for one more. Yeah, in the front. Has there been any issues in integrating these processes into the culture of the bash show, or is it all full float very smoothly? Good question. Yeah, so the question is, uh, have there been any difficulties integrating this into the process or the culture? Um, yes, there have. Um, so for example, not everyone was convinced that having dialyzer have to be clean on every uh, commit that was merged. Um, my best advice is just turn it on and start failing builds. And uh, people start to see like, oh, hey, I guess that was a real bug that you know, is preventing my code from being merged. Uh, so one day we just turned it on and said, look, your code's not going to get merged in if it doesn't pass dialyzer. Give this a shot for a month, and if we all hate it, uh, then we'll stop using it. And nobody has once complained about it. Um, so I guess, you know, the takeaway is sometimes just do something. All right. Uh, thank you. I'll be around if you guys have any more questions, though. <laughs>